good morning, afternoon, nighttime, overnight time, whatever time you're listening to this. I'm Dr. Jeff Williams from the Exercise Science Institute, and I'm coming to you with uh, chapter two or the bio, the biomechanics of resistance exercise from the NSCA textbook and the prep material for you to study for the CSCS exam. This chapter expands upon chapter one, just like we like to see the sequence of everything. And chapter two with biomechanics, it's common terms that we see within biomechanics that really, I think, are continuously used over and over again in the world of strength and conditioning. It's not something where, you know, how sometimes words get thrown around and you know, uh, you know, professionals try to use bigger words than they need to or whatever. No, we're not seeing that in this case. These are very clear and concise terms that just they come up all the time because you need to know what you're up against when it comes to how aspects of the body move to create this coordinated movement that we hopefully expect to make it into sport with, well, you know, strength and conditioning is predominantly sport, but also for high level exercise, even rehabilitation, whatever it might fall into. So let's just dive right into this chapter two. So the first thing that we work with is the actual definition. So the mechanisms through which components interact to create movement. So mechanisms, the way that things are working through which components, well, what components are we talking about? We're talking about the muscular system, how the muscular system reacts to forces and, it, and its interaction, all right, well, we, need, we know that muscles have to interact with bones. So we have to know that there's an interaction between the muscular system and the skeletal system. So both of those have to work in coordination, obviously with the nervous system as well, um, to be able to make coordinated movement patterns and that's to create that proper movement. So this is what we're gonna really dive into. And the first part of it is skeletal muscle. Skeletal musculature, as this is. So yeah, it's the system of muscles that enables the skeleton to move. Kind of what we just said about before. The, the thing that's really interesting about skeletal musculature is that there is a lot of depending factors on origin and insertion points or origin attachments and insertion attachments on the body that can put somebody into more of a advantage than others. And just thinking about that, we understand that you know, depending upon proportions of a, of a person, even though attachment sites are important and they're very, they're very consistent among people, they're in different places depending upon structure. So someone of my stature and then someone else of the same stature that might have a different build than I do might actually have a mechanical advantage, meaning that their body doesn't actually have to work as hard or as, or I shouldn't say I work as hard, it can actually produce more force based on how it is structured. Now, on the other hand, it could be that they produce less based on that. So that's why, you know, there's a lot of um, really good information out there that really suggests that, you know, the structure of musculature inside of a person's body can really help them to get to that next level. Now, it's not the only thing, but you know, there are advantages to it. So we have to think about that. But for this case, origin insertion, origin is the, it's this proximal or what is toward the center, closest toward the center of the body. That's your origin point. Your insertion point is the part that's farther away or more distal away from the center of the body. So when you're talking about these points, these are the points that we talk about of where does the muscle attach at the origin? you know, and then where do we talk about at the insertion? And then that's where those lines of force are going to come into play, which will be in a couple of slides here, but you'll start to see how these insertion points will really make a difference on line of pull and then being able to really just overcome the force of something that you're trying to move, especially when it comes to weight training in particular. So some other key terms here, agonist, antagonist, synergist. This is, this is what we're talking about in terms of muscles. So an agonist, is like it says, the muscle most directly involved in bringing about a, a movement. So really, I mean, you've probably heard this before, but the term prime mover and agonist is that prime mover. It is the, the main muscle that are main muscle or main muscles that are used to move you in a specific direction. The antagonist is the muscles that slow down or the other term you might hear 
thrown out across either other textbooks or other um, organizations is decelerate. So a muscle that can slow down or decelerate or stop the movement in, in you know, amongst itself. So, you know, it, and a lot of times what we call that is the opposing agonist. You know, it's the antagonist or the opposite of it. And then synergist, that's a muscle that assists indirectly in the movement. So it's usually an assistant, a, a, an assister of the agonist. So usually with a synergist, it works in cahoots with the agonist to help you be able to do whatever movement we like you're trying to figure out or what you're trying to complete, I should say. Progressing a little bit farther with the skeletal musculature, here we talk, we start getting into levers. Now, levers are a little bit um, of that next level in terms of like step up. So now you, you got the skeletal musculature. Well, we talked about line of pull. I said that before, overcoming force. Well, here's how that happens. And it depends on the lever of the actual system, you know. And so there's three different types. So what we're trying to say here is many muscles in the body do not act as levers, which is kind of weird. But ultimately, you're like, well, why does that? Well, no, because basically the the structure of our system and how it is is on our limb base, those are really a lot of the main lever type muscles that we discuss. A lot of other muscles don't have that specific proximal and distal um, insertion points that can create that different type of movement. So that's really why you're like, well, shouldn't all muscles be levers? Well, no, because it depends on the line of pull or the motion of the, or the direction of the force that's applied to it. Body movements directly involved in sport and exercise primarily act through the bony levers of the skeleton. Yeah, we're gonna discuss that in a little bit. Um, and a, le a lever is a rigid or semi-rigid body that when you apply a force to it, right, and with its line of action, it does not pass through its pivot point or the point that it moves or the fulcrum. And then it exerts force on any object impeding its tendency to rotate. And that's a lot to do with biomechanics. You know, now you're starting to see the physics component of everything. Lines of force around a rotating point or a pivot point that will create or exert force onto whatever it is that it's trying to rotate. And a lot of times, we'll t you know, with biomechanics, a lot of the, you know, main terms that we talk about is torque. And that's the rotational force that's provided. That's why it says tendency to rotate. And that's really what we're trying to, to work around is what are those forces? Where's the line of force? Where's the line of pull to overcome the resistance that we're trying to overcome? So a lever, a lever, in this sense, this is right out of the book from figure 2.1. If you look, you'll see, and we'll go into each one of these parts, but your fulcrum, that is your axis of rotation. That is ultimately where, when you are moving, where is the rotation point? Because you have to have the opposing forces that are uh, that are affecting it. Now, in this sense here, the fulcrum, it is right here in that center section. Now, if you look, the lever in this sense is the direction or the line, okay? Now, if you look at the other points, FA, we'll start right over from the right here. This is the force applied to the lever. So a force applied. On the other end is the force resisting. So here we have a resistant force and we have an applied force. So, and then right here are the M's. The MAF is the, the moment arm or the, of the app applied force. That's where you would draw, draw that uh, parallel line to be able to distinguish that line of pull or the applied force. And then on the other hand, the RF is the moment arm of the resistive force. So the lever applies a force on the object equal in magnitude, but opposite in the direction of the for, you know, the, the, um, the force of the, uh, the resist, the resistant force, the R, RF, FR. Okay. And so all of these, what we're saying is that when you have your fulcrum, you're going to have opposing actions. You're going to have the applied force and you're going to have the resistive force. The resistive force is that of what mechanism you're moving, whether it be um, a handle for a cable machine, whether it be a barbell, a dumbbell, 
a medicine ball or or it could just be your hand and you know, maybe your hand or leg in general like if you're going to try to kick a soccer ball or throw a baseball that's where we can talk about all of these things now it doesn't have to be just it doesn't have to always be an object it can be the motion of the limb in particular so here we'll discuss this further into what type this is it's just let's get these terms out front here so that we can discuss it moving forward so the next step is talking about what we call a mechanical advantage i use that term previously but a mechanical advantage it is exactly what it states right here the ratio of the moment arm all right so if we go okay well where's the there's our moment arm okay that line on top okay the ratio of the moment arm through which an applied force acts to that through which a resistive force acts. So you, that moment, the ratio is if it's above one, it means that you don't have to put as much force out to be able to get something to move. Whereas if it's less than one, it means you have to apply a greater force. So when we talk about something that's a mechanical advantage, it means that the body does not have to work as hard to move something of basically equal force at that point so it just becomes a lot it's a lot smoother of a movement in terms of the fact that it can be um it, there's a there's a, you're truly an advantage to it now less than means that your body is going to have to provide more applied force against the resistive force and so therefore your body is in a disadvantage which means that you have to work harder to move something of a specific weight or um, distance. Now, here's the first one, first class lever, okay? Now, a first class lever is a lever for which the muscle force and the resistive force act opposite. Now, one of the things that, um, examples that you can think of, think about a seesaw, right? A seesaw has the fulcrum in the center and then has the opposite forces on each side. So depending upon the situation, if you look at it here, you'll see that this is the tricep. This is working with your tricep and how a first class lever acts upon a tricep. So if you look, the O is your fulcrum. That's your, that's your rotational center right down in here. Now, when you look at that, where is the, where is the resistive force? That's what we're, the force we're trying to overcome. Well, at this point here, it's down. It maybe we'll just say there's, you have a handle in your hand that you're trying to do tricep push downs. So the handle is in your, your arm, your, your fingertips. All right, so that's where the resistive force is coming from. The cable and the weight stack that you're trying to move is providing the resistive force within your hand. It's not just your hand, it's that the cable is, is, the res, is basically acting as the resistive force of the weight stack. So, MR is the resistive force moment arm, which you can see here is 40 centimeters length. So basically, if that if that cable um, handle was in your hand from where it is to where the insertion point is of the musculature is where we're looking at um, the distance. All right. From the hand to the arm. Now, the other aspect of it there, fulcrum resistant. Well, where is the actual um, applied force coming from? Well, the applied force is coming from the muscle. That's where all the applied force is. So the force of the muscle right here in the actual tricep is where we're doing that. So that means that as we're, the force is being applied up, we're going to apply upward force on the tricep. And that moment arm is only actually five centimeters in distance. Now, remember we said here with a mechanical advantage, if there is a if it's if it's greater than one, it's going to be where you have to apply less force. If it is less than one, that means you have to apply more force. So in this sense, what we're saying here down on the bottom, I'm going to highlight it, is that this mechanical advantage of the of the muscle divided by the the moment arm of the resistance actually equals 0.125 so we can say right there that that is below 1.0 so when you use your triceps you're actually in a disadvantage so that's where you have to apply a greater amount of force to be able to get something to move and that's uh, you know simply stated that would mean that for it to be 1.0 or higher we would have to have a muscular 
um, or a movement arm of the muscle to be longer, to match that of the resistive force or the, the moment arm of the resistance. And that means your tricep has to be that much bigger or it means it has to um, have a different you know, line of direction. And this is really where that becomes Ultimately, it's where we just have to understand our body is in a disadvantage and we got to work harder to move that resistance. That's why when you're doing tricep pushdowns, you know, you can, you know, it's a, it's a tough, challenging movement. Second class lever. This is where the lever for which is, you know, a lever for which the muscle force and the resistive force act on the same side of the fulcrum, meaning that it's not like a it's not like the first class lever where the the fulcrum is in the center think about somebody who's uh, i said a seesaw as an example think about somebody who is trying to cast a fishing line they where is the rotation well if you put your hand on the bottom of the fishing pole and you have your hand above that you have one hand above that and you go to swing the fishing rod back to throw the line out where is it rotating from? It's rotating from the bottom of the handle. That's your rotation point, or really from your hand at that, you know, if you want to think about, you know, more specifically. So here, you're going to have the resistive forces that are going to be above where the fulcrum is. And if you're thinking about the fishing line, right? And then so on the same side of the fulcrum, the, the muscular force and the resistive force are on the same side. With the muscle force acting through a moment arm longer than through which the resistive force acts. So because of that, like it says, due to the muscle's mechanical advantage, the required muscle force is smaller than the resistive force. So it's opposite of that. It's not the muscular force is actually smaller, whereas a first class lever, the muscular force has to be larger than the resistive force. So you're in more of an advantage type in the second class. So here you go. When you're uh, thinking about um, plantar flexion, so putting your tiptoes into the ground, pushing up through your ankle. So here, the actual point of plantar flexion is where? A lot of people are like, oh, well, you're going to rotate through the ankle. No, you're not rotating through the ankle. Thinking about where does the rotation happen? It happens in your toes. That's the fulcrum. All right. So what happens is because of that, we have to oppose forces. So in our sense, when we're just, you know, just say that we have, um, you know, just say you're doing it with body weight and you're trying to do heel raises, right? You're trying to bring the heels up off the ground to raise them and get the calves to work. If you notice, where does the yellow direction take you? The yellow direction is the resistive force. And, and if we don't have any weight on us, then, you know, in terms of like a barbell on our back or whatever it might be, what we're do, you know, what our resistive force is at that point is our body weight and force against gravity. So that direction is, is directionally, it's going down. Well, to help ourselves rise up, we have to be able to provide an upward force. And if you notice the blue arrow, that's your muscular force, that is going to be in the opposing direction to get us to drive up off the ground in a plantar flex state. So where's the fulcrum again? In our toes. Where's the resistive force? It's between the muscular force and the fulcrum. And because of that, what ends up happening is you have a larger, like we said, a larger moment arm. And if you notice the dotted line, how do we know we have a larger moment arm? Well, look where the fulcrum is, look where the muscular force is. Or, and so that creates a moment arm longer than the moment arm of the resistance. So therefore we're in a mechanical advantage, which, you know, again, if you think about trying to get, you know, try to do a tricep push down versus trying to do, and I know it seems kind of crazy, but you know, not crazy, but it seems kind of obvious, but yeah, a tricep push down is pretty hard. Now, when you try to do, or even a, just say a tricep push up, if you think body weight, now try to lift yourself off the ground with your toes, you know, and raise your heels up off the ground. It feels a lot easier than if you were trying to do a tricep push up. You know, so that is where, you know, the second class lever really shows that it is a very, very, very mechanically advantaged state because the, the muscular, the, the muscular moment arm is actually longer than the force arm. And then lastly, there's your third class. And I think you kind of might know where we're going here, a lever for which the muscle force and the resistive force 
act on the same side of the fulcrum, similar to that of the second, with the muscular force acting through a moment arm shorter. So where is the muscular force gonna be? It's gonna be in between the resistance and the fulcrum, which is a little bit different than the second class where the muscular force was the first and then the resistive force was in between the fulcrum and that. So if you wanna think about it from that standpoint, where do we, you know, where, where is the, you know, in that case, we want to think about, um, you know, think about, you know, being less than 1.0. I was trying to think about the, you know, I'm like, no, it's less, it's what less than 1.0. So that, so therefore the muscular force has to be greater. So it's very similar to a first class lever where you have to have a greater amount of force. And I want to go back and clarify, I, I made the wrong analogy when you are using a second class lever and I, I said that it was like a fishing rod, well, I was wrong. A fishing rod is actually like a third class lever. A, a second class lever would be using a wheelbarrow, right? Because if you're, if you're using a wheelbarrow, where's the axis of rotation? Well, the axis of rotation is actually at the wheel, the weight or the resistive force is the load of the wheelbarrow and then your hands on the handle are actually the, mu the muscular force. So you can see the muscular force is out farther than the load. And that's where I apologize for that, but I just wanna clarify that before we keep moving on here. And then a third class lever, like I said, is the, the fishing rod analogy. So um, got a, a little backwards there. I apologize for that, but I wanted to clear that up before we kept moving. So your third class lever acts to rotation is at the handle, the bottom of the handle. The muscular force is where your hand is actually the first hand that's right above, and then the resistive force is that at the top uh, where you have to launch the rod. So it's a little bit different, and this is how we'll show. So the bicep, all right, if you notice that there is, you're like, well, this doesn't make any sense because wouldn't the muscle of wouldn't the bicep muscle be on the other side of the fulcrum well no it's not because look where its attachment site is so if you come down to the bottom if you notice follow my arrow if you look right in here and you notice that there is the attachment site to the forearm right the resistive force is in so we're okay let's just let's back up the, the fulcrum is at the elbow. We know that if we're doing a bicep curl, for example, look how short the moment arm is for the muscle because the attachment site is right as you get onto your uh, radius, okay? So when you start working in that fashion, right, that, that's a really short moment arm. And look how long the resistive arm is to the, the force that's in your hand, whether it be a barbell or a dumbbell or a cable uh, hold or a resist whatever it might be whatever that resistive force is is in your hand and you can see how much longer it is so because of that we know that that's going to be a decimal place number which means that it's below one and we know that because of that our body has to work harder now interestingly enough the crazy part about mechanical advantages is as this resistive force moves up and we start going into a different direction and I'll kind of I just want to kind of throw this out there to you all and um, really kind of make you understand that if we were to have and go into this direction right here right if we were to take I'm trying to make this a little bit thicker so if if the road if we go up in this direction and we and we know that that's where the arm is gonna go as this right here starts moving upward and it gets closer to the body you know we know right here that when this happens what technically is going on is that the resistive force is shortening its moment arm so it's actually becoming a little bit shorter which means that as you move that weight from starting point of really basically all the way down and as it rotates up toward your body, once you get to a certain point, there becomes a mechanical advantage because the moment arm of the resistance is changing with momentum 
that you're building from the muscular force, it actually starts becoming easier as you start getting to a certain degree of movement. So this is where, you know, deeper dives into biomechanics will show that. And it really becomes um, really, really um, an interesting aspect because that's what makes our bodies, you know, very, very unique is that we can, as we move in certain directions, we can actually become more mechanically advantaged. And that's why when we train people, we wanna know, okay, well, with those disadvantages, how are we gonna make us stronger to make them uh, more powerful and be able to work harder? And that's really key to that. And this kind of ties into the next slide where we talk about the patella. Now, if you notice, I said something about like how, you know, there's certain attachment points that really make a difference and how those attachment places move. Well, the patella actually changes the degree of which, you know, the, the tendon that crosses over the knee allows the quadricep to move. So if you notice in letter A, like it says over here to the left, the patella increases the mechanical advantage of the quadricep muscle by maintaining the quadriceps tendon distance around the knee. If you had, if there's your patella right here, all right, and that patella is really creating this longer amount. And if you look at your, from your axis of rotation, it, it, you know, there has that depth to it. Now, if you don't have, so where's the, the patella is non-existent over here, right? And so because of that, you have a straight down insertion point. And that right there changes the complexity of the actual ability of the quadricep muscle to do its job. Up here, the quadricep is in a better aligned position and it can re react to the forces applied to it at a better a better rate and a better angle so therefore you can you know the quadricep can be used more effectively and that's really you know a, a really key component so if somebody has a patellar injury it can really cause a massive change like meaning like just say their patella is no longer there like that can become a huge disadvantage for somebody you know with that with that injury that occurred and it actually can create an imbalance from left to right in terms of the legs So moving forward, we talked about moment arms and mechanical advantage. This is kind of what I was hitting on. As you see how your angulars, your, your changes in angle make a difference, look what happens with these, uh, you know, as your elbow flexes. So when you become engaged in a specific way, that axis of rotation changes and it becomes more challenging. Well, that's why whenever you, this is why we talk about cheat reps, yeah, you know, I'm sure you've heard that term before. We're talking about cheat reps. Well, think about a person who doesn't bring their arm all the way back down to this position here, right? This is where we're supposed to be from our starting position in terms of a bicep curl. I'm sure you've seen people that stop halfway, maybe here, you know, or they might, they might come to here and maybe they don't come all the way down. So when you do that, it really changes the dynamics of, you know, of, of how the actual workout works. So it's super, you know, and that's why when we see this super short moment arm right down here, right in this region here, that means it's going to become more challenging. Now, if you notice over here, the moment arm is also, you know, shorter here, but that's because you're getting toward the end range of the, of the actual movement. Why do people have this tendency to uh, cheat their reps? Well, look at if we if let's get rid of all these lines, right? And we'll we'll go back to the beginning of this slide. Look at look at the actual moment arm. So we look at the distance here from here to from here to here, and then from here to here, we actually see that you have a little bit more room, and then definitely more from here to here. And so because of that greater distance, it makes the, the exercise easier if you don't lower the weight all the way back down. So that's why you see people have cheat reps. Now, I understand that there's a time and a place for this, but if you're trying to actually enhance biceps, you know, in this regard, well, you need to be doing a better job of returning the weight all the way to starting position so that, 
it can actually use the full range of motion to create a better pulling or better force adaptation versus um, cheating those reps. So little, you know, and that kind of hits right on what we're talking about here in terms of, you know, how this whole slide is worked. So when the moment arm is shorter, there is less mechanical advantage. And that's what we're saying. But the reason why it's shorter, like I said over here, is simply because of the fact that you're getting to the end range of motion, but you're also getting to the point where this arm is now in the upward fashion of the motion. And so that it doesn't, it, it the mechanical advantage there is that the muscle just can't apply as much force because it's already in a um, shortened state. But if you're going through that motion, it feels easier because you're also, you've also overcame that initial uh, disadvantage. So, th and this is exactly what I was talking about here. As you lift the weight, you can see how the moment arm acts in different ways. Well, we see that the moment arms are the longest, you know, in certain, in certain spots. Where? Well, at the bottom, mid-range, and then right through here. So that's the crazy part is that, you know, when we go through each one of those motions, it's purposeful and that we use it the right way. And that when you cheat the rep, it doesn't allow for um, the actual muscle to get used in the, the, the highest state. I'm sure you've seen this before too with people who do uh, pull-ups because pull-ups are another one of those things where as you're pulling down on the, you know, as you're pulling through the handles of the rig, you know, what do people not do? They don't let themselves all the way back down. So that changes the complexity of the actual motion. So same premise. So what are we trying to drive home here? Most of the skeletal muscles operate at a considerable disadvantage. We know that we've seen it. Why? Because two out of the three levers actually are always in a disadvantage. So we have to provide more force to overcome the resistance that's applied. And like it says here, forces in the muscles and tendons are much higher than those exerted by the hands of the feet on external objects. Well, that's pretty straightforward. If you try to do a, a back squat or a deadlift versus a overhead press or shoulder press, strict press, push press, whatever, you're going to be able to lift more with the hands and the feet um, ver, you know, um, versus excuse me, you will be able to lift more with the, the lower bar, the lower body than the upper body, just because of the differences in musculature and the tendons that are applied upon it. So what I was talking about earlier, variations in, in, in structure. One of the things you'll notice here is that as we talk more about this is that you have variations in tendon insertion and tendon insertions where the tendon attaches to the bone and that creates either a that arrangement will either create a faster motion it can create a slower motion so it just it depends on where it's located so just say you have someone who has an injury and they have to just say they have to reattach the tendon to a different area it can change everything and i think it's really kind of interesting uh if you've ever seen the movie rookie of the year they it, it kind of is along these lines they say it's from different elasticities but or you know whatever but because they had to change the location of the injured site for the young kid he was able to pitch super duper fast and then when he got hurt again it you know it changed that trajectory so that it just it kind of makes me crack up a little bit when i think about that movie if you've never seen that movie it's actually kind of you know heartwarming and you know whatever but it's from i want to say it's from the late 80s early 90s but neither here nor there i'm getting sidetracked um this is what i do with my students all the time so it's actually kind of funny that it happens during this but yeah so what i'm trying to say is that it, it depends on you know if a person was injured what happens well what really happens is it, it changes the dynamics and structure of the muscle and on that line of pull and what are we talking about line of pull well let's go back to where we were you know, where's your moment arm, you know, where's your moment arms for your muscle and for the resistance and that makes or breaks what will happen. So when you look, uh, let's, so if you look here, if you look at A and you look at B, 
what we really want to look at is insertion. So I'll just kind of highlight the areas here. Muscle origin is right up top here on both, and they're not changed. But if you look, the muscular insertion, I'll just kind of highlight the area right in here, and then muscular insertion right in here. Look at, and these are the same size images back side to side. Look where the difference is in the insertions from the A to the B, B being a little bit farther down the arm. Now, if you were to take this and, and, and say to yourself, well, how, where does this apply in life? Well, like I said, injury is one, but think about it. Um, a would be more of, A is definitely a human, but B, that muscular insertion, that would be more getting more resemblance to like a gorilla. Now, if you've ever seen anything with gorillas, you know that those, those animals are stout in their arms. Well, and they're able to swing, you know, from trees without having any problems. They're very, very strong. Uh, but, and if you notice their structure, they don't have as straight of an arm as we do. Well, that's because the insertion point, they're already kind of in a state of contraction where the tendon is in a different position. So because of that, it creates them, it creates a chance for their muscles to be able to be stronger. And so because of that, what ends up happening is you have greater torque um, on that actual joint, which is the elbow. And because of that, there's less rotation needed you know, at a slower speed. So therefore you can just create force without having to work as hard. And that's why gorillas have a tendency to be in, in most, and actually I think in all sense, senses, stronger than a human at that point. And that's, it's, and a lot of it has to do with that insertion component. So that's very, very intriguing and, and, and really kind of cool to know. So Shifting gears, get out of those levers, and let's get into um, a little bit of planes of motion. Again, this should hopefully for some majority of us, this is a repeat of everything, but we understand that the body is broken up into three different planes of motion. And those three different planes have different attacks on the body. Now, when we look at this, we will see that you have your left and right sections. So that's your sagittal plane, right? That's what we want to see. And that's what we want to know about is the actual left and right pieces are your sagittal plane. And if you notice here, it's the one that cuts the body into right and left halves. I really wish this was more straight than diagonal, but it is what it is. Now, the other part, is your frontal plane, which slices you in a front to back. All right, so you have your front and then you have your back and then you have your transverse plane, which is cut you in half and that creates an upper body and a lower body. And because of that, what ends up happening is you have specific, you know, you have very specific motions that'll come around that plane. So sagittal plane, that's very front and back. Very common, like walking. Walking is sagittal plane, it's front and back. Frontal, so that's sagittal. Frontal plane is more side to side motion. So like if you were to take and do lateral raises with a dumbbell, that's a frontal plane um, motion, a side lunge. If you're gonna step out to the, a lateral lunge to the side. And then transverse plane has rotation. So. Um, whether that be doing, you know, um, road, you know, if you took a, a rotating lunge, that's a, that's actually in the transverse plane. You're rotating the system around that plane of motion around the axis of rotation, I should say. So with that, you know, you have major body movements, like we said, that will rotate around. Now here they are. And I recommend that you Definitely, definitely, definitely go through. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I definitely feel like if I want to, uh, yep, so figure uh, 2.10 or 2.10 inside of your book, what you'll notice is all of these. And I suggest, you know, understanding what adduction is, abduction is, understanding what flexion and extension are. You need to know these things 
they are very, very important, number one, for your test, and number two, they are important for application to the real world. So we have to pay attention to them and know them. Know them by the back of your hand. You know, if you don't know what a specific, you know, what what is a deadlift? You know, what what type of emotion is a deadlift? Then that's gonna be challenging for you to understand what the reaction of those muscles is gonna be. So we have to pay attention to that. Know these. And especially, like I said, know them because of the fact that it's going to be on your test. So let's go from the uh, anatomical planes into strength and power. Well, strength we know is that we're trying to lift something as heavy as we can. So basically, we're trying to exert as much force at any given speed. Okay. Uh, strength really is the, you know, if we talk about max strength, max strength is the maximum amount of resistance that you can overcome for one specific rep. So that's really what we're talking about there. Acceleration is, you know, really a change in speed going, you know, when we talk about acceleration, we really talk about going from a, from one speed to another. So increasing speed as quickly as possible. Deceleration, change of speed or slowing down as quickly as possible. Acceleration and deceleration are massive in the world of strength and conditioning because most sports require a slow down or a stop and try to do it as quickly as possible. And I mean, there really aren't too many sports out there that don't have an, a, a deceleration component. So, um, you know, we have to, you know, if, there, if you're thinking about any sport, it's like, well, what sport doesn't require change of direction in, in most senses? You know, and because of that change of direction, you have to have a acceleration and a deceleration component. Then on the other end, you have, those are basic. On the other end, you have positive work and power. Now, power is really the definition of it is work divided by time. Well, what is work? Work is force times displacement divided by time, and that's power. So work is force times displacement. Power is force times displacement divided by time. So all of that there is to say that, well, what is power? Power is really just explosive strength. It's strength that you are able to do very quickly, all right? If you think about, you know, well, what, what's, very, what's powerful? Well, you know, think about an Olympic weightlifter. That's power. That is strength, maximal strength as fast as possible. Now, could that person, you know, do, does that person have a greater amount of maximal strength for specific components? of their body yes they do but they have they are extremely powerful which means they have strength that is very very fast so you know just say they do a clean and jerk right well the you know, or a snatch doesn't really matter a snatch you know when you squat or a clean and jerk when you clean and squat those individuals probably and i'm going to say not probably do have greater back squat strength or front strut front squat strength than what they show inside of that lift. So what does that mean? They have a high level of max strength, but they also have a high level of explosive strength. So that's really what we kind of want to work around there because power really is it's, it's force. Well, force could be just your body. Think about a vertical jump. How fast can, or, you know, how explosive are you? What is your force? Well, force is your body weight and working against gravity. All right, what's the displacement? How high you jumped divided by how fast you jumped. That's how you can, I mean, ultimately, in, in a really unregulated nature, you could determine how much power output you had based on those three things. Weigh the person, and you know, you don't, if you wanted to be more specific, you could, you know, be very mathematical and adding in gravity, but really, if you just weighed the person, right? If they weighed 200 pounds, that's how much they weigh. What's their displacement? Well, how high do they jump? And if you have somebody timing them from the time that their feet left the ground to the time that they hit the little ticker on just say the vertex, then you can find a rough estimate of what their power output is, you know, and that, that makes a big difference if you don't have like an apparatus at your, at your facility. So moving forward, negative work, you know, what are we talking about negative work? Whenever you hear the term negative work, think about eccentric. And that goes into, you know, concentric, eccentric, 
um, and isometric terms when we start when we get to those points. So negative work is work performed on rather than by a muscle. So think about a bench press, right? You do a bench press and as you bring the weight down and you're trying to control that weight in the opposite fashion, that's actually negative work. And typically with eccentric muscle actions or opposing muscle actions, which are not concentric, which is usually the output, eccentric is usually the deceleration for the most point, for the most part. And what we talk about with that is really more force can be put out. That's why people can, if you had a one rep max, you can actually lower the weight of your one rep max a lot easier than you can press it. So that's why people can go over their one rep maxes when they're doing negative work. Well, what's the problem with that? You need a spotter and you need somebody who can basically you need at least at least one person, if not multiple people to lift the weight back up because you can't physically do it because it's over than your max. Then you have what we call angular displacement through which, you know, like an angle through which an object rotates. And so rotational work is torque times angular displacement, how, you know, degrees of change. And those are you know, we can put, we can find that through specific testing as well. So I, I use um, weightlifting has a, you know, like I said, it has a much higher power component than sport of powerlifting. Powerlifting, you're not going to be as, a, I'm not saying, I don't think that this is like a dig, but powerlifting is raw strength, max strength. And it, you know, the weight is going to move as fast as the load that is applied to it. Meaning that if you're just say that you have a person who's trying to lift 900 pounds on a deadlift for a powerlifting competition, that weight's going to move relatively slow compared to a person who is trying to clean and jerk 400 pounds and the, you'll see the weight move a lot faster. So I know it's varying people and such, but the expectation of powerlifting is it's, it's going to move as fast as the weight allows it to. Whereas powerlifting, we know, is going to just drive it home. So when we talk about strength and power, biomechanical factors, neural control, that's talking about your nervous system, motor unit recruitment. So neural control, when we talk about the strength component, recruitment affects maximal force output. So if you're a person who has been training for a while, your body understands how many motor units really to turn on at the right time, and then it will recruit them effectively and efficiently as they feel the strength has gone up. But it happens so quickly and your body adapts so quickly that you're just, like it says, rate coding affects maximal force output by determining the rate at which the motor units are fired. So because of that, if you have, you know, an ability, if your body has been you know, training for a long time, your, your recruitment patterns and your rate coding are happening very quickly because your body is detecting changes very rapidly. And because of that, it'll start saying, send out more, send out more help, send out more help, send out more help. So the other problem is that the other, besides neural control is, is your muscle cross-sectional area. You know, a person with a small, just because a person has a smaller muscle versus another person, does that mean that they af can effectively lift more weight? Well, usually the person who has a larger volume of muscle that has, okay, so let's just put it this, this way. If you have the same neural control, but you have a larger muscle, that larger muscle is going to be able to work better than the, than the same neural control in a smaller muscle. So it just, it, when it comes to strength. And then there are other factors too on the right hand side are the arrangement of your muscle fibers. And so if your muscle fibers are arranged correctly, then you'll have a the angle of penation or the basically the way that the fibers run within the muscles, they run along an imaginary line. And with that line, those fibers will pull in a specific manner. So because of that, that it basically means that you're, you're, you know, if you have a straight zero, it corresponds with no penation, which means that the muscles origin insertion is changed versus a muscle that may have a 45 degree penation. All right. And so because of that, you know, it changes the dynamic of the muscle itself. There's your penation angles. Okay. Rate, radiate, longitudinal, fuse form, you know, unipenate, bipenate, multipenate. 
And depending upon, you know, what you're looking at, you know, by penny, you know, you, you know, you, our, our, our rectus femoris is one of the strongest muscles in the body. Um, and, and you can see the penation angles in it are not solely uh, straight up and down. They have, they have that uh, little, I don't, I don't mean, you could say 45 degree angle, but that makes them very, very strong. And that means that their strength can be exponentially larger than others. Muscle length, when it's at rest, when it's stretched and when it's contracted, all of those things matter because depending upon how well your body is able to use actin and myosin, that's exercise physiology, you know, understanding how the cross bridges work will create a, a very strong person. Now, when the muscles are at resting, you know, they, they are ready and willing to accept force. They can then, if they're at rest, they are basically able to generate force. When muscles become stretched, they cannot be creating force. When they're stretched, they can't create force. When they're resting, they can generate force. And then when they're contracted, basically what happens is that can, you know, not stretched, but when the muscles, to think about it, when you're sitting around on the couch, you're ready to move and therefore you're able to generate force when you are stretching, right? If you're just, just say you're sitting on the ground, you're trying to reach out and touch your, touch your toes. Do you think that you could deadlift right from that position or, or try to pull something? No, it beca- it's, it, you can't, it just, you can't control because that force, it, because of the stretch, it's overstretched and therefore the force capabilities are diminished because they the cross bridge sites are not available for you at that point. And then when you are when the muscle is contracted versus stretch, now there's a difference. Contract, you know, contraction has stretch, but it's not full stretch. When muscles are contracted, your ability to generate force is decreased because their cross bridges are reduced. They're not unavailable. So that's the reason why, you know, at certain lengths, it's like, okay, can I, can I push a little bit more? Well, it depends on, are you fully contracted? Are you stre- you know, fully contracted to a stretch state? Are you, are you getting back to resting where you're ready to rebound and do it again? It just depends on that situation. And that goes by, like we said here, resting, contracted, and stretched in terms of your actin and myosin. What we said here is, a, is the look over here and look at each one of these images, right? Each one of those images is basically saying to you, this is what, you know, we're looking to do. And by, by looking at this image here, we can see that, you know, look at the resting, they're ready to touch in contraction. They're, they're, they're starting to become overlap. There starts to become an overlapping because the H zone or the center section right down the middle is disappearing. So you're, you're, you're running out of room is really what it comes down to. And then when you're contracted, you just, you have no, you have no attachment availability in that stretch state. And therefore the actin cannot, you know, you, the myosin heads cannot connect to the actin because the, the pink is not available for the green in this sense. So what else we have joint angles, muscle contraction, velocity, and joint angular velocity. So with joint angles, we talked about torque before rotational force. It depends on the force versus muscle length, leverage type of exercise, um, the body joint in question, the muscles used and the speed, all of that's going to make, you know, really make or break what your joint angles are. So that really changes depending upon what part of the body you're working on. And because of that, you'll have a different amount of torque that can be applied. And that's what we were talking about with lower versus upper body rotational torque. You know, you have a lot more ability for higher levels of torque with muscles like in the lower body because they can produce more force. Um, You know, muscle, muscle contraction velocity. It says it's nonlinear, but in general, the force capability of muscle declines as the velocity of contraction increases. Force capability of a muscle declines as the velocity of the contraction increases. Therefore, if you try to move something very, very fast, you're, you're diminishing the ability to provide more force on it. 
and then joint angular velocity, which we're going to talk about here, revolves around things like these forces, you know, concentric or, or, or right here. You know, if you're looking at where do we stand in terms of joint angular velocity, I'll go back to these key terms in a second. Um, with force velocity curve, what we're saying here is that in essence, force velocity, as the, as the speed of something increases, the ability to produce more force decreases. And if you look, where are your flexor and extensors highest levels of joint angular velocity? It's in the eccentric state. So what that's saying is that when you're decelerating, you're able to provide more force at that point. And the angular velocity in your degrees per second, look what happens when you start to, so let's say, okay, let's say you're doing a back squat. When you, so just say you're standing up, right? You're kind of in this center section, right? There's no angular velocity. You're standing straight up and down, which represents that perfectly. When you lower the actual weight down to the ground, you've actually started to, your joint angular velocity is going in a negative degrees per second because you're lowering it and your flexors and your extensors are able to have more force in that point. But as you start to concentrically move, so you get to the bottom in the hole and you press out, look what happens when you start to speed up. The torque that's provided is actually diminishing the amount of force output you're able to produce. So it changes and look at, and, and as you get higher into your uh, angular velocity, meaning you're, you're moving faster, your ability to provide more force is actually diminished. And that shows it right there. In decelerative terms, you're able to enhance it, but it's going to drop off, not as much as concentric. But then when you come pushing through it, you know, you're pushing through and you're able to overcome the force that is being applied to your body. You can see here that you are now basically moving faster and you're diminishing, you know, you're diminishing that force capability, which is basically what we're saying right here when it comes to those aspects. Now, the other thing, and I'm going to kind of switch a little bit gear here in terms of the muscle actions, concentric, eccentric, isometric, concentric, meaning that it's the muscle shortening. And like I said, the forces generated within the muscle and acting to shorten it are greater than the external forces acting on its tendons to stretch it. I mean, you could press through eccentric lengthening of the muscle. All right. And like I said here, a muscle action in which the muscle lengthens because the contractile force is less than the resistive force. The forces generated within the muscle and acting to shorten it are less than the external forces acting on it. Okay. And then, oh, I'm sorry. And then isometric means that you're, there's no change in length because there's equal opposing forces. So think about it. When you're doing a deadlift, right, and and just use as because it's a really good example or a back squat or a bicep curl. It could be any of them. And you get to a point where you're starting, you're, you know, you know, the weight is heavy and all of a sudden your, your body stops and you're, you're, you're kind of shaking a little bit and you can't, the weight doesn't seem to be moving in the direction that you're pulling it. Like a deadlift off the floor, all of a sudden you get halfway and you can't go anymore. Well, you've ultimately become isometric because you're matching your force. The muscular force is the same as the resistive force so therefore you're not moving up or down so what eventually happens is as you try to pull harder and harder and harder it becomes harder to lift the weight all the way up because you're not your force matching has now diminished and you have to drop the weight to the floor and that changes everything so a lot of factors here strength to mass strength to mass ratio typically the heavier you are usually the stronger you are um but like I said, in sprinting and jumping, the ratio directly uh, reflects um, an athlete's ability to accelerate his or her body. Just think about each type of athlete, right? Who are leaner? Sprinters, are, sprinters and jumpers are definitely leaner. Look at powerlifters. They're thicker. They, you know, they're, they, they can just move more weight and their body weight is able to um, reflect that. Um, but at the same time, when we talk about that's, that's overall strength. If we talk relative strength, then who, you know, who are some of the strongest people that we can 
uh, talk about gymnasts are some of them. The gymnasts, they're very light and they're very strong. They ha they can lift from, you know, if they can move their body in ways a lot of other people can't. And their strength to mass ratio is through the roof because they're light, but they're strong. And then body size, you know, obviously, again, look at look at um, football, your your linemen versus your linebackers versus your uh cornerbacks and safeties look at your quarterback oh let's not use them look at your linemen versus your running backs versus your wide receivers and your tight ends all of them have specific playing positions because of their body size but what do we try to do maximize who they are as a person depending upon their size that makes a big difference and that's basketball that's baseball that's hockey you know all of those things matter so like, you know, a key point here in sport activities such as sprinting and jumping, the ratio of strength of the muscles involved in the movement of the mass of their body parts being accelerated is critical. That's why you don't see sprinters that are very, very thick. You know, like we're talking about thick, like power lifters. So there's a strength to mass ratio that makes a huge difference. They are light as a feather, but they're strong as an ox, you know, and that makes a huge difference when it comes to acceleration. Um, so gravity, we know that gravity is going to affect, you know, how the body moves because like I says, when the weight is horizontally closer to the joint, it exerts less resistive torque. When the weight is horizontally farther from the body, it exerts a more resistive torque. Think about it when you're doing, um, just think about, um, hold it, take a weight, just take a 10 pound weight and hold in your hand, lift your arm all the way straight out and leave your arm straight out and see how long you can hold it there. And then lift the weight up, bend the elbow to, you know, 90 degrees and lift that weight and hold it at 90 degrees. Feel which one you can which one do you think you're going to be able to hold up at 90 degrees longer? Well, it's going to be the one with the bent elbow because the weight is closer to the joint. And that makes a huge difference. Why is that? Because it's not the elbow that's holding and supporting, it's the shoulder that's holding and supporting. So that makes a big difference where the weight is. That's why when we talk about deadlifting, you don't want the, the barbell to be all the way out. You know, we don't want that barbell even remotely close to the toe, the, the tip of your the, the tip of your shoe. We want it closer over the shoelaces because ultimately gravity has more effect on it. But obviously the angular the angular ability of the body is diminished when the weight is farther out as well. That that revolves around torque angular velocity or excuse me rotational velocity rotational force so exercise technique can affect the resistive torque pattern putting it farther away versus closer away and that shifts the stress among the muscle groups so if you have the bar the barbell just say you're, again you're holding the barbell and you're lifting it straight out in front of you it, you have your deltoids there but at that point the stressor might require you to you know basically increase the number of motor units or pull upon different motor um, different pull upon different muscle groups to help assist pulling that weight up talked about gravity Ta you know this is like weight stacks you know your, uh, gravity is a source of resistance but machines provide increased control over the direction and pattern so like it says here you know in a cam base the moment arm of the weight stack varies um, and that and that can change you know, you as a person and how it affects everything. So when we look at weight stacks, you know, is, is it closer? Is it farther away? Those can, that has a very big difference on the contraction of the muscle because the resistance is changed based on how the, the, the cam or the, the cable pivot point is moving. So that, that makes a big difference, which sounds crazy, but that's why the, if you look at, if you go to a gym and you notice that there's different types of cable machines and they have different shapes, that's to increase or decrease the amount of torque on the system. Um, and then here talking about sources of resistance, there are four main things, inertia, friction, fluid resistance, and elasticity. So, when you talk about inertia, force of gravity acts only downward. Inertial force can act in any direction. So at that point, lateral, like it says here, upward or lateral acceleration of the weight requires additional force. So 
that's why if you're going in different directions versus gravity, it's easier to take a weight and push it into the ground than it is to pull it off the ground. So inertia makes a big difference. Gravity only moves up and down. Inertia can move in any direction, lateral, forward, backward, up, down. Friction, you know, friction is a resistive force encountered by when one person moves an object against another. Think about trying to push a uh, sled. A sled has, to, has friction because it's the sled pushing against the floor or the, the bottom surface that you're pushing against. That adds additional weight. Or, and it creates more muscular contraction. Fluid, re, fluid resistance is um, when you're passing through a fluid, you know, think about trying to do a box jump, right? You're jumping up onto the top of a box. Now, if you were to take and try to jump from, you know, in water, jump up onto that same box, it's gonna be more challenging. The muscular contraction is gonna have to be more, more, more aggressive and can it match it? And then elasticity, the more an elastic component is stretched, the greater the resistance. So all four of those are gonna have, you know, different abilities of muscular contraction depending upon what you're looking for. Now, you could take in the friction out of something and it changes the whole dynamic of, and it's like, oh, that was a lot easier moving 90 pounds with no friction than it was 90 pounds with friction. Um, you know, concerns, back injuries, understanding that, you know, we're always susceptible. So that's why we have to make sure we train in accordance. Also making sure that our, our back is, um, they say generally in a moderately arched position. So what we're saying is that, you know, we're basically rigid. We don't want to round our back, but we want to have an, you know, an aggressive lower a lumbar spine. So it, it may look a little bit more arched than, than typical. So, but again, the risk of injury from resistance training is low compared to that of other sport and physical conditioning. So yeah, because you're, you're, you're trying to be safe and effective and that makes a big difference. So the one thing is, you know, are we using, um, lifting belts? Are we using lifting belts? And, and we're, we'll talk about as a fluid ball. So what we say about the fluid ball is that as long as you're engaging your, your, as long as you're breathing with your diaphragm and engaging your abs, you can create this weightlifting belt that doesn't mean you need a weightlifting belt. And like, for, I'll give you an example. I don't lift with a, with a belt, but I, I use my, I breathe correctly and I create this, like it says, fluid ball, which basically creates a tightening of the, of the deep abdominal muscles and it, cause the diaphragm is engaged correctly and it allows me to stay in a nice rigid. And if you notice here, there's that the, they're talking about that lower, lower back arch. That's a good lower back arch. It's not completely straight, but it's slightly arched. And that's what creates a positive positioning that you want. Also with the fluid ball by creating the Valsalva maneuver, I understand that there's always been like, I don't understand this, but there's always been scare on the Valsalva maneuver. Well, no, if you don't hold your breath and create this Valsalva technique, then you cannot engage your diaphragm correctly, which doesn't lock in your abs correctly, which does not give you this fluid ball. And so therefore you have to, but you have to be able to also understand how to decrease that pressure without losing that rigidity of the spine, the abdomen and the diaphragm. So once you start releasing air, you're gonna crumple in a heap. That's why you have to, if, if you're doing a back squat and you're coming up out of the back squat, you have to release that pressure, yes, because you're gonna, you know, you could potentially pass out um, because air can't move in and out of the lungs and you're, you're changing this pressure. So you have to be able to, you know, breathe out accordingly if you need to. Um, I know that usually with, you know, I make sure obviously I reset my breath after each rep, but it's very important to understand that, you know, you can hold your breath and it's okay to hold your breath, but you have to release it. So don't be telling your people to hold their breath for five reps because they're going to be passing out and you're wondering why. And then, you know, some other concerns, there's a shoulder, the knees, the elbows and the wrists. Obviously the main concern here is, you know, shoulders is warm them up, you know, make, you know, they're very prone to injury. Make sure you warm them up correctly. Uh, make sure you keep them balanced because you can have uh, asymmetries. Um, you know, you can, you can move at controlled speeds, but you know, all, ultimately just like any other, you know, just any other body part, just be aware. The knees, the knees are definitely prolonged. 
Um, it says here, minimize the use of wraps. Interestingly enough, I, I used to, um, I still use them, but I use knee sleeves. And one of the things that I've started to do, even though I should have been doing this a long time ago, is I've started eliminating them um, every day. And I've been trying to lift heavier without the need of them, but then when I do need them, they are readily available and it feels so much better. So, you know, minimize the use of wraps, use them only as needed, but just be aware, you know, warm up correctly, be balanced as well. And then the elbows and the wrists are very similar as well. Um, overhead can become an issue. Uh, throwing can become an issue and tennis, you know, like racket sports can be an issue. So we want to take care of our elbows and our wrists, you know, effectively and keep them strengthened, keep them mobile, keep them, you know, working correctly and that'll help. So, but that's the, you know, the causes of concern. That's really the main gist of this biomechanics, right? This is chapter two. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. You know, I um, welcome any support that you guys have. One of the things, if you're listening to the end here, one of the things that I have, you know, one of the things to keep us moving, and I'm, I hate being the salesperson here, but we do take donations and all of those donations get put into a, uh, an account. And when we get to a certain point, we can start working on recording equipment and being a little bit more assertive with our, our things that we put out to the public. And that goes a long way versus coming all out of my pocket. And, you know, I'm never one to look for a handout, but like any, any support is welcome. And I, you know, hope that, you know, people will, you know, get what they need out of all the information I'm providing and, and eventually give back. And, um, you can feel free to leave me a comment if you want to donate. You can, uh, I think, you know, YouTube now has an ability for you to leave it directly in and it goes directly to me um, as a gift. But I, anything is appreciative and I, I appreciate it and I'm very appreciative if you are willing. So, um, again, this is chapter two, biomechanics. Chapter three should be coming soon. And I hope you guys are getting what you need out of this because. This is one of the things that I love doing is teaching and especially from strength and conditioning content. So let's keep at it, keep studying. And like I said, if you have any other questions, just please feel free to reach out and we'll, we'll try to knock them out for you. So thanks again. This is Dr. Jeff Williams, Exercise Science Institute. Peace out.